Hello, and welcome to Richardson RFPD's Tech Chat. I'm Kirk Barton, Field Application Engineer for Richardson RFPD, here today talking with Dr. Deepak Gunasakaran, Power Conversion System Application Engineer at Analog Devices, and we're talking about short circuit protection using isolated gate drivers. Thanks for joining our Tech Chat today, Deepak. Thanks, Kirk. Uh, thanks for having me. You bet. Um, so just to get started here, can you give an example of an ADI device with short circuit protection features and maybe a typical application it would be used in? Yes. Um, so a typical application for the short circuit protection feature would be in a traction inverter. Um, if you can look at the figure here, um, this shows the overall block diagram that's inside a traction inverter. Mm -hmm. and we are really interested in protecting these silicon carbide or IGPT um, you know, devices in this inverter. Um, this inverter is used to drive the motor. So in the event of a fault, either occurring on the load side, which would be on the motor windings or something inadvertent happening on the inverter itself, um, our gate driver would be able to detect it, turn off the device um, that is undergoing the fault condition. So we have a whole lot of gate drivers in our portfolio that has this feature. Um, the one shown here is the ADUM4137, uh, which is one of our uh, gate drivers used for automotive applications. The figure on the top actually shows you the uh, teardown of a commercial EV inverter just for you to see the power modules that we are interested in protecting. Okay, okay, thank you. Now, when comparing different types of semiconductors like silicon carbide versus an IGBT, what are some of the differences in short circuit withstand capabilities of the devices? And in particular, what causes a silicon carbide module to fail? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, we've done quite a bit of uh, testing in our labs on the bench to uh, try and find out the limits of the silicon carbide device. So typically um, IGBTs can withstand uh, faults for let's say about 10 microseconds or so. Um, what we're finding out is the silicon carbide modules are able to withstand for three microseconds. Um, that's like the max we've seen. But um, if you look at the waveform on the top, um, the green waveform is the gate voltage going up and can see the yellow trace actually is the um, short circuit current measured um, going down, but actually it's reversed. So um, you should read it as going up. And then the uh, teal trace is the drain to source voltage across the silicon carbide. So as you start out, there's um, this is a case where we are turning on into a fault. So as the gate voltage goes above the threshold, the current starts to increase and you can see here this is a 400 ampere rated module and the peak current reaches up to 6,000 amps. Okay. And simultaneously, if you look at the drain voltage, you're sitting at around 300 to 400 volts. So this is deep in a saturation for the SICK device. And so when you have simultaneously such a high voltage and current, um, there's just so much uh, heat dissipation on the part. And then after um, about three microseconds from beginning of turn on, um, the module is damaged. Um, takes usually takes both the gate driver and the sick module. You can hear a a pop <laughs> um, on the bench. Uh, okay, okay. Now, can you explain the fault detection circuit itself? And do all ADI drivers have short circuit protection? Sure. So we have really two types of fault detection that we see commonly used uh, for different applications. But for something like the traction inverter, uh, high power uh, applications, um, we really prefer the DSAT type of protection. Um, so the figure on the top uh, left shows you the DSAT uh, detection mechanism. Mm -hmm. So what it really does is the capacitor, um, what we call as the DSAT capacitance, um, kind of reflects the voltage on the drain of the power switch. So um, depending on what that voltage is, a comparator internal to our driver would 
be able to detect a fault and then uh, turn off the device in question. Um, also, we need to keep in mind that we have some high voltage diodes in the loop so that um, the gate drivers don't really see the uh, high voltage that occurs during switch turn off. Um, so the overall detection loop involves these diodes and um, uh, a filter capacitor usually added externally, that is the RC, um, and then a current limiting resistor in series. The other method uh, which can be used in some low power applications is to directly detect the current that's flowing through the SIG device by adding a shunt resistor. Um, this method is intrusive, so the shunt resistor has to be added onto the circuit, and then we would measure the voltage across the shunt resistor using a comparator um, and then detect a fault. So if you look at our product portfolio, the 4135 and the 4136 um, offers the DSAT type of protection. The 4137 and 38 um, also offers the an extra comparator so you can choose uh, or choose whichever comparator you want for individual uh, purposes. Like you could use the OC comparator to do a DSAT or you could use it uh, to direct, directly do a shunt resistor based detection. And um, so basically allows flexibility to implement both methods if needed. OK, OK. Can you give an example of what a short circuit protection l circuit looks like itself? Yeah. So if you, um, let's say, have a, imagine another silicon carbide device or a IGBT um, connected in a, in a half bridge type, you will have a high current flowing through the silicon carbide device. And so if you look at just the DSAT um, detection, um, the voltage on the silicon carbide device would start to go up as the current keeps on rising. And so once you've hit like, let's say, over 500 amps or 600 amps um, due to the fault current raising quickly, um, your DSAT detection diodes would basically be reverse biased, uh, which is the D1, D2. Um, that would cause current to flow from VDD2 through C1, um, causing that voltage to raise up. That would then trigger the DSAT comparator. So that is typically how the DSAT detection works. Uh, if you piece it as uh, with respect to current going up and then the diodes turning off, um, and then you would have uh, you know, capacitor going up. You could also have a case where the fault isn't as hard to turn off D1 and D2. And so um, the diodes would keep on, uh, you know, they would block a voltage, but um, the current would still go in from uh, VDD2 through R2 um, and would keep the capacitor C1 at a voltage just above um, the drain to source voltage of the power switch. They'll just be different by the diode voltage drop uh, to keep it off. Okay. And um, are, is the fault detection time set or, or can that be varied? Yeah. So some uh, part of the fault detection time uh, is fixed based on um, the type of uh, gear driver you use. For example, if you use the 4135 or 36, um, we have an internal blanking time, which is the duration of time the switch B1 on the top left is on. And so for that duration, we don't want to be monitoring a fault because um, as the switch S1 is going from a off to on position, we don't want to be detecting a false positive. So that time on the 435 and 36 is uh, kind of fixed uh, for to take care of a wide range of modules uh, or discrete SIG devices. Um, but the pieces that you can control are the external filter time, uh, depending on how fast uh, response you need or uh, how much uh, sensitivity or fault write through you need. Uh, you can set the R and C. And then uh, there's the comparator delay, which 
for the 435 and 36 is about 300 nanoseconds, but um, that is something also fixed by the gate driver. So the the goal is that um, that these timings and all the expected performance be budgeted before uh, you know, expecting how this would perform. So that would give the user a very good picture on uh, what to really expect when they put all the pieces together. With the uh, 4 and 3, 7 and 3, 8, um, because of the extra comparator, uh, we are able to offer on the OC comparator a really fast response of 75 nanoseconds. Um, and since the part also has a spy programmable feature, um, you could program in the different blanking times that you need for the uh, different power modules. So you could have a really beefy module and you might want a 400 nanoseconds of blanking and you could set it, or you might just need 100 nanoseconds. So it gives a lot of flexibility in uh, adjusting the different uh, pieces involved in the overall detection time. Okay, okay. And do you have, a, do you have any examples of um, some circuit waveforms for a hard, hard switch fault case? Yes. Um, let's go here. So this is a test we did with the ADUM4137. Uh, we took a half bridge silicon carbide power module rated for about 400 amps. And you can see here that we put in a copper bar between terminals one and two, uh, emulating a very hard fault right at the terminals. And we turn the high side switch on, so it's deliberately turning on into a fault. And you can see here that um, the yellow trace shows the gate voltage raising. Mm -hmm. The blue trace is the drain to source. And then the red trace is the short circuit current um, flipped over. So that is actually the current raising. So you can see here that we are able to detect a fault in about 500 nanoseconds or so once the device you know, starts to turn on. And then we go through a really fast uh, protection mechanism. Uh, so you can see here that the total time we take to uh, clear the fault is about 800 nanoseconds. Um, so basically the device is turned off within 800 nanoseconds of uh, starting the uh, or turning on the high side switch in the presence of a fault. So the fault can continue to exist beyond that, but our device is uh, we've ensured that the SIG device is turned off safely. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, that's nice. Um, any any other uh, aspects of the um, short circuit protection features for analog devices? Any other aspects you'd like to cover? Yeah, um, so there are really three important pieces um, that determines how fast you can detect and turn off. First one is uh, obviously the external detection loop that we want uh, to be set uh, that is outside the part, but we are able to provide both uh, adjustable fault detection times for different modules and also provide a optimal fault turnoff path. So as much as we want fa fast detection, that's only uh, one piece of the um, full puzzle. So we have to also be able to turn off the switch uh, needed. So that you know, is dependent on the layout and uh, type of module used, but um, many of our drivers allow uh, customers to really set the required uh, turn off rate needed so that you can adjust the slopes of the soft turn off um, so that you don't over voltage during uh, fault turn off. Okay, great. That's great. Thank you very much, Deepak. We appreciate your time today, and thank you all for watching our Tech Chat video. You can learn more about this and other topics on the Richardson RFPD Gannon SICK Tech Hub. Follow our Ask an Expert link to submit questions relative to design challenges you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Kirk.